What do you get when you combine a world-class EMS physician and medical director? I speak pretty good English for a guy from Detroit. <laughs> with an EMS veteran and all-around nice guy. Well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Oh, that's so good. Oh, my God. Well, you get the EMS show. Take it into the people. Here's your host, Dr. Ritu Sani and Mike Verkast. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to a special edition of the EMS show. Mike Verkast, Dr. Ritu Sani, and our special guest, uh, Steve Worth. Good morning, gentlemen. It's uh, great for uh, to get together with you guys. And unfortunately, it's a um, it's kind of a sad situation that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, first of all, appreciate you jumping on on this holiday weekend. I know not everybody celebrates Christmas, but uh, nonetheless, it is a busy weekend for everybody. So, uh, Dr. Sani, how are you this morning? I'm doing okay. I am um, I, I am part of that group that doesn't celebrate Christmas, but how I celebrate Christmas is by working um, yep. so that my partners who celebrate Christmas can be home with their families. So I'll be oh, working nice. today great. and Very tomorrow. Nice. Um, yeah. as I do every year, because that's uh, awesome. If I can keep one person home, yeah, and that's what we do. That's very nice, good. very nice. Yeah. yeah, and Steve, how are you doing this morning? You're on the East Coast somewhere. Yes, doing great. Uh, broadcasting here from uh, Florida today, but uh, it's great to be with you both, and uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I really appreciate you all tackling this very difficult uh, subject that we're going to talk about today, because it certainly has. Uh, uh, it's potentially a game changer for EMS and how we uh, interact with law enforcement and provide patient care and so forth. So I'm uh, really yeah. great that you all are on top of this to talk about it today and to make it available for everyone else on a recorded basis. Yeah, it's definitely uh, been a um, crazy last couple of days since this verdict came down. Lots of uh, buzz on the social media networks, on X, on Facebook, everywhere very polarizing. And, and I just want to let everyone know today, we're not going to be sitting here talking about how we feel about guilty, not guilty and all that kind of stuff. I think it's clear. And Steve, we'll let you talk a little bit more about this, but I mean, uh, it is what it is. Right. And so I think we're, our time is better spent saying that this is the world that we're living in now. Right. And yeah, what can we do as providers, as medical directors um, to sort of, um, I don't even want to say adjust because really it's stuff we should be doing and should have been doing the whole time. But um, what can we do to kind of move on in this world a little bit? So, um, yeah, uh, Ritu, absolutely. What, were, what were your thoughts on that? So I, I think I think that's exactly right. I think that uh, what's done is done and we need to move forward. I also think we need to acknowledge that there's a young man who died um, uh, and that this truly is a tragedy. Um, and uh you know, that he didn't need to die, that there was, uh, you know, clearly something was wrong here. Um, what I what I think it might be worth doing, though, just for about 30 seconds, and maybe I'll ask Steve to do this, is to recap um, just a couple of the details, because I think I actually saw on, on, on social media a couple of people asking, so what was this about and what happened? So I don't know if worth just recapping. We've talked about this case on our show more than once. Uh, we're now, what, three years since the incident yeah, occurred? 2019. Yeah, 2019. Uh, four years. It's almost four years. Uh, almost right. five. Um, but, uh, I mean, I thought the the I guess I can do the recap in like two se 10 seconds. There was an incident where a young man was... Um, uh, where a young man was walking home, there were police were called for a suspicious person. There was an altercation that occurred. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to what led to that altercation and uh, and whether it was really an altercation or not. Um, and that's not part of what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, EMS was called, administered the young man a dose of ketamine, the dosing of which is part of the issue. Um, but um, he uh, suffered a cardiac arrest while in the hands of EMS and uh, and uh, uh, then was uh, declared dead. I think two, he was resuscitated and then died two days later. The fallout from that case includes a lot of legislation in Colorado around the use of ketamine and other sedatives in the field. 
It also included from a, from the police officers and the paramedics on the call, uh, ch criminal charges, uh, as well as civil charges. The family of Elijah McClain received a civil settlement of $15 million as a result of all this. Uh, and then the reason why we're talking today is that on Friday evening, the jury reached a verdict of guilty um, regarding the two paramedics involved in the case. And Steve, what were the, there was some difference in the two charges and, and between the two paramedics, is that correct? Well, the charges are pretty much the same. Um, the, the more serious charge was of course, uh, the manslaughter charge, which both paramedics uh, were found not guilty of. And then there was the criminally negligent homicide uh, charge that they were both found guilty of. Criminally negligent homicide is akin to involuntary manslaughter uh, in other states as well. So uh, of course, uh, uh, manslaughter requires more specific intent to commit the act. Uh, criminally negligent homicide is akin to, in a way, gross negligence in terms of uh, it was involuntary uh, action. But uh, bottom line is one of the paramedics was also convicted of, of second degree assault uh, involving the administration of the ketamine. That was a more serious charge. The uh, criminally negligent homicide carries a, uh, a jail sentence of one to three years uh, under Colorado law, and uh, the second degree assault charge is much longer than that. It's two to 14 or two to 15 years, something like that. Mm. And I just want to say up front that we weren't involved in the case. We were not experts in the case. We're sort of like everybody else on the sidelines. Uh, we've listened to a lot of the testimony, not all of it. Um, we've been monitoring it closely and, and commenting on it. And I think really what this case does is it allows us to really reset and rethink about how we treat these situations and how we deal with patients in the field, especially those in custody. And a couple of themes that emerge, I think, from a teaching point in this case is that number one, we always have to put the patient first, yes. uh, always at all times, whether the patient's in custody, person's in custody or not. Uh, in EMS, our job is to stay in the lane of care and advocate and to intervene and to try to engage and, and work together with law enforcement at the scene to treat the patient. Any interventions, whether it's a medication like ketamine or airway or other drugs, whatever it might be, all of those things have to be done in the interest of the patient, not in the interest of convenience or law enforcement desire to subdue or sedate somebody. <clears throat> and we have got to change how we interact with law enforcement. We've been saying mm -hmm. this for a number of years. Uh, you know, we talk about the handoff of patient care from law enforcement to uh, EMS. Well, I contend that there really is no clear cut handoff, nor can there be. When we're on the scene with law enforcement, it's a collaboration of care. We're all there working together and we need to work with law enforcement. They need to defer to us on the medical side in terms of medical issues. And, and we also need to be assertive and communicating and all of this stuff needs to be worked out ahead of time. Like we do in training, you know, practice this, put policies in place and things that uh, more clearly delineate the roles and responsibilities of law enforcement uh, versus EMS. So I think, you know, in the sense, as we said, this, there's a dark cloud here as a result of this verdict. Uh, I personally don't like the idea that we have a case where uh, now medical errors or alleged negligence has now become criminalized. Uh, but as Mike said, that's the reality of the world today. If you Google and take a look at other cases, there's probably at least a dozen cases involving nurses who have right. been charged with and some convicted of uh, uh, criminal neg negligence and yeah, involuntary we, manslaughter and so forth in patient care situations. So we did a, we did a, the world has changed. Yep. There's greater accountability and visibility and transparency. And I think uh, we need to work on ensuring that everything we do is going to look good from the outside, uh, you know, on, on a visual, whether it's a body cam, audio, or whatever it might be. Uh, it's really important to uh, focus on what we can do from this point forward to change our approach to managing these situations. I guess that's my quick take on it initially. We, yeah, we did a, we, I can't remember if we did, I know when we were in New York, we did a live version of our podcast where we talked about the Redonda Vought case. Yeah, I lost is, you there. 
Um, can you hear me now? I, I've you got me? you. Okay. Steve, can you hear me? Oh, it looks like maybe he was maybe a little frozen, but go ahead. Ritu. Yeah, it looks like you were frozen there for a second, Steve. Oh, now I can't hear him at all. Live, te li <laughs> live, live television. Live technology. What, yeah, what are you going to do? Steve, we cannot hear you. All right, he can hear us now. Um, but uh, that was weird. That's weird. So anyway, so while Steve is fixing his thing, we did a case, we did talk about the Redonda Vought case, which is the case in Tennessee where the um, nurse gave the, the wrong VE medicine, right? They gave yeah. the Vecuronium instead of the Versed, put the patient in the CT scanner, and they um, and they passed and away. Passed away. So, All right. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. All right. I switched again. Okay. We're good. Uh, uh, I, I think that a, I lot, think of that a lot of people are concerned that like the sky is falling, that, that, that we, maybe I don't need, I shouldn't do EMS cause I'm suddenly at some type of increased risk to my life and my family. And, uh, that, uh, this isn't worth it anymore. And I think yeah. there's a little bit, I think the last four years have made people feel like maybe this isn't worth it anymore anyway. Um, but it, you know, it, it creates a lot of worry. Right. Absolutely. I think there's concern about that in terms of, gee, is this something I want to get into if I can be charged criminally? Uh, but as someone said, in one of the comments I, I read, you know, if you provide compassionate and competent patient care, you don't have to worry about, uh, ending up in a courtroom or being charged with a crime, you know, there's, there's, you know, some risks certainly. And because we are being looked at more closely under the microscope in the society that we live in today, that's just a natural thing. But I think uh, we can ensure that that risk stays low by doing the training and, and putting the policies and procedures in place, having good medical control and oversight of these events that occur that's going to be the thing that's going to help uh, avoid the kinds of problems and issues and the tragedy that we saw with this Elijah McLean case. Yeah. And I, and I, and I wonder to myself, you know, kind of like as the, as the paramedic sitting here and, and just kind of reminiscing and thinking back over time, you know, this is my 28th or 29th year in the business. Now, granted, I've haven't been working with patients in the last, you know, year and a half or so, but, but is it really, is it really new? Is it really new? Right. Are the consequences really new? Like, I don't, I just have a, I don't think they're new. Like, I think those things have always lived there. Um, but I mean, clearly something has changed, right? Like, I mean, I can remember, like, I try to put myself in their position. Have I ever been in that exact position that these two paramedics found themselves in? Probably not exactly, but have there been you know, echoes of similar things that I've experienced in my past. I mean, if, I think, of course, there have been, <clears throat> but I, I think the the dangers, if you if you want to call it dangers, I think those have always existed. I don't think that it's anything new, um, but it makes me think as someone who worked in sort of the training realm, clinical leadership over the last 12, 13 years, um, it makes me think, um, you know, every time those crews go out on a call, I always had this thought and feeling in my head that if something was to go sideways, um, guess who's going to be in there right alongside with them? The training guy. Who else is going to be in there? There's going to be a stack of protocols right next to them. Is the medical director going to be involved in some way, shape, or form? Yes. And in this particular case, he was, um, I believe he came in and testified, but he wasn't He wasn't charged in the criminal side of things. I think he might have had something to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but, but is there something that the medical director was involved with in the civil side? Civil I don't remember. Side, I don't remember. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I don't believe the medical director was directly involved in the civil case. But, you know, what has changed? Nothing really in the sense of the law, as you mentioned. Uh, nothing has changed in these laws. But what has changed is the advent of body cameras, is the uh, advent and the change of, of societal uh, feelings today. We've had the Eric Garner case of about 13 years ago in New York City, the first I Can't Breathe case. We had George Floyd case. We've had Tyree Nichols. We've had other cases as well where, 
you know, our care and, and treatment is at the front and center, you know, and as well as the interaction of law enforcement. So that has changed. I think there's more transparency, uh, peeling the, uh, the cover back a little bit and seeing what happens on these calls on a, on a very specific detailed basis. Yeah. Um, so Ritu, as a medical director, I'm just curious your thoughts. And then really what I want to do is I really want to transition to um, an article that you had published uh, just recently. I think it was on Friday, Steve, actually. Um, uh, or Yeah, it was Friday, I think, um, that was published in GEMS that really did a great job of detailing out some of the stuff we're going to talk about, um, but really going forward. But Ritu, what, what are your thoughts um, as a medical director, is anything in your world changing, so to speak? I mean, I know there was some talk about, you know, specifically, um, maybe not in this case, but it, when it comes to, you know, using medication to restrain a patient, um, you know, making sure that those pathways are clear, right? That there is a clear indication for if such and such happens, then we're going to go with this, you know, method. If this and this happens, then we're going to try to go with this method and kind of trying to take the subjectivity out of it the best we can. So, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So we, we, a couple of, I've had a few thoughts, but we went down this pathway with our program and our system uh, probably four, probably three or four years ago. It, it might've even been pre pandemic that we did this and pre George Floyd, but this has always been sort of a known kind of high risk situation on two fronts, liability now criminal as well as civil. Um, but also safety. And so balancing the safety of the crew, um, because I know that like sometimes when we sedate people, I'll get a complaint from my emergency department that the patient arrived and they were too sedated to get a history from. And my response is, um, well, this patient was punching things and we're going to put this patient who was punching things into a three foot by five foot box with you and see what how you like it and they're like oh yeah no that makes sense so so the safety piece versus the the um and, and we focus on on documenting those things that are clear indicators of a safety component and then we've created a, a protocol that sort of has a range of medications that they can use to um to to deal with the patient um, based on sort of the the the, um, the behavior they're seeing right then, right? So that's the key. When you anything you hear about when you pull up on scene, you need to put in your brain is like this. These are all indicators of safety risk. So just if you get there and the patient is calm, but they were re reportedly very agitated five minutes ago, your brain has to be like safety risk, safety risk, safety. But you have to manage the patient in front of you which includes evaluating them, speaking with them, uh, and, and giving them, you know, and we have a range of different medications that we can use at that component. Since this case occurred, and like I said, it's been three or four years now, uh, we actually have been using this case as a case study. Uh, when we talk uh, in one of my counties about a, a year ago now, we focused on uh, inter patient restraint uh, as a, uh, as a, as a as a drilling point in one of our multi agency trainings, and we used this case as the case study that we we uh, that that we talked through. I think the I think that the other thing, the big lesson from a medical director perspective, is uh, um, you are always on camera because even even if the police aren't there, somebody's got one of these phones, right? Somebody's got an iPhone or an Android phone, and they are um they are going to um they're 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 you're going to somebody's going to see you and and i one of the things about this case is that i don't want to talk too much about the actual case but 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 you have to at the very least look and act like you're compatible that you, like you care and, and and if you don't it's going to look bad because we're there's going to be another bad outcome because there's always, but I mean, we're going to avoid, we're going to do all we can to avoid them. Right. But at some point, somebody, something bad is probably going to happen again. Uh, hopefully not. Um, and you want to have done everything correctly, uh, including caring for this person 
when that happens. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you got to get down on the patient's level. You got if the video shows that you made efforts to say to the police, hey, let us get in there. Hey, he's not moving. We need to check him out. Hey, there's vomit here. We need to assess his airway. Uh, when you're good, if you hear that on the video and see, you know, paramedics trying to intervene, that may change the outcome in a case like this. Uh, but we didn't hear much of that in, in this case, unfortunately. And uh, that, you know, is, of course, part of the evidence that came into the decision of the jury, I'm sure. But absolutely, and getting back to those basics of taking the equipment out of the truck and bringing it to the side of the patient whenever possible. Look, we know you can't always put a cardiac monitor on every patient, especially one who's combative or difficult to deal with, but uh, we need to bring the tools of the trade with us. And I gotta tell you, I'm hearing more and more from my colleagues and friends who are paramedics that uh, you know, equipment being left in the truck, let's walk the patient to the, to the bus, okay? This is another phrase that I think should be eliminated from the EMS vocabulary. It's not a bus. It's a sophisticated medical uh, delivery vehicle. And when we call it a bus, we denigrate what we do. And I think leadership should take a position today and say, we don't call it a bus anymore. Uh, yes, we're seeing more patients who call for the ambulance who don't need it. Uh, we're seeing more and more difficult situations, but we've got to ev take every call afresh, just like it's from scratch. Don't accept at face value what other people tell you. When a police officer says he's non-compliant, what does that mean? He's non-compliant with your verbal instructions because he didn't stop when you told him to, or is he hitting you with his fist? You know, what does that mean, non-compliant? So we have to assess the scene safety for sure. And, you know, we can sit back and quarterback this thing and look at everything, and that's the advantage in a trial like this, which is unfortunate for those who are the defendants. People are living in this video over and over and over again, okay? But they have to make split-second decisions, and it's difficult. So everything we say has to be tempered with, yeah, you know, it's not easy out there, and there's going to be situations where we may not do the best job or we could have done things differently. That's why we got to medically review every one of these cases. Every one of these law enforcement interaction cases should be QA'd, should be case reviewed, uh, you know, with everybody involved to say, hey, what went right? What went wrong? What could we have done better? Uh, and that's how we're going to learn uh, from this case. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't agree with you more on that. Like the whole idea of the bus or the whatever, you know, self-deprecating term we use for the ambulance is absolutely ridiculous, right? Like, and, I, and it, it's just a mindset and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, accept, don't accepting what you're taking for face value. We're kind of going through some of these, you know, principles that you can take. Again, these are nothing that is new. This is all stuff that we should be doing. Like the bringing the tools of the trade with you to that patient bedside or the street side or whatever it is. Like, I can't tell you, like, as, as an attorney, I'm sure you've seen this more than I have, but even just as, as a training officer, right? Um, I don't know how many times people show up with empty hands, right, at, at a call. Like, it just boggles my mind, you know. At, at the fire department I was with, um, they would never dream in a million years of ever going and showing up to any kind of call for a smoke, uh, possible fire. They would never get off the truck without something in their hand, an ax, uh, a tool of some kind, a, uh, a an extinguisher, a water can, something. They would never do that. But how many times do we hear in EMS where we just roll up, no gloves are on, we're just kind of just like going to check out what's going on. You know, it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm I'm on a soapbox now. It's so dumb. But go go ahead, Steve. Good. Let me let me if I could say this. That leads to the mental health questions here. There's two aspects to the mental health question here. One is the mental health of our providers, and they've been subject to a hell of a lot. Increasing yep. injuries, uh, you know, increasing assaults, etc. But also we've pretty much defunded mental health. Back when I was at emergency care in Erie in the 1980s. We had a police car, car 201, named after the, stat, the section of the Mental Health Procedures Act, staffed by police officers who were trained psychologists and licensed psychologists. They came to these calls. They helped with the situation. They were the mental health professionals. We got rid of all that federally. And now we're left caught in the middle, all of us in EMS, dealing with this mental health crisis in the field. Okay, So we've got that. 
and we need to support our, our providers. We're seeing attitudes of apathy, laziness, disrespect, and there's many, many causes for that, okay? And then we can bring in the 600-pound gorilla into the room, unconscious bias. Does that play a role in this? Does the color of the person's skin, the neighborhood they live in, their economic position, if they're throwing up at 2 in the morning outside the mini-mart in a pool of vomit, are we going to automatically assume they're intoxicated on drugs or are they having a heart attack versus vomiting in their living room at the mega mansion up on the hill at three in the afternoon? How do we, what's our mindset here from the get go, from the dispatch information? We all are human beings. We all bring biases into a situation. We just got to learn to deal with it because the studies and the research is out there that says African-Americans are not treated as well as white Americans when it comes to pain management in the field. Women aren't treated the same when it comes to cardiac cases and you know their symptoms are often dismissed. The list goes on. So there's lots of research that shows that bias plays a factor in this as well. Now it did not come out real big in this case, interestingly yep. enough, but you look at all the cases that are out there and it is a factor in all the the, the, the big uh, high profile cases that we've seen. So that's another area that we need to address. Mental health of our providers, mental health for treatment of patients in the field uh, and, and uh, dealing with uh, all of this stuff related to um, response and, and making sure that we're providing the best possible care through our attitude and making sure we don't prejudge people. That's really what it comes down to. I'm sorry. Now I'm on my Oh, it's all good. I mean, we're all preach, 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 brother, Steve, you've hit a lot of topics that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, obviously the unconscious bias and, and, and equity of care are, are topics that we talked about at this podcast many times. I've spoken at many national conferences about that and any MSP has put out a lot of statements about this, uh, that are, um, uh, super, you know, that are, that, that go into this more in more detail. And I'll be talking again about this, uh, at fast 24 also, but, um, you know, there's a, there's one of the jokes that one of that, that, that I make, and this isn't supposed to, we're not supposed to make a lot of jokes today, but you know, how do you know that the patient's lying to you? Cause their lips are moving. Uh, one of my friends refers to his patients as their worthy adversary. And this isn't meant to denigrate patients, but what w the message that I'm trying to say, and I need probably, if that's the only quote taken out, that's probably bad. Um, that you, you should enter every case, every call that you are on with a healthy dose of skepticism, that you should be skeptical about the information that you had there is a very that you have going into it. There's a very in the world of quality and case in the world of quality. There is a in medical errors. There's this concept of anchoring the idea that you your first thing that goes into your mind as a possibility is what you anchor upon. Yeah. And and, you know, there are cases uh, probably the most common place where we see anchoring as a problem are in cardiac cases where the, the symptoms are GI in nature and you anchor on the GI components. But the point is that you should um, not, you should go, you should try to wipe the anchoring free, whether it's a medical call for a vomiting, chest pain, abdominal pain, or also a call for a behavioral emergency agitated patient. Um, you know, you need to be skeptical about the information that you are receiving uh, so that you can, um, so, so that, you, so that you can take in the whole surroundings and do your own individual, uh, assessment of the situation. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that, that is perfect. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, the chest pain thing is, 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 is so perfect. I mean, that's just such a great an, an analogy, I, I guess you can call it for the anchoring, right. Cause I mean, we all find ourselves doing that. I know Steve's, uh, messing with his uh, headset there a little bit, see if we can, I've been having him on mute while we're talking because for some reason we're coming through on his computer. Let's let's unmute him and see if it helped. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. Hey, yeah, good. there we I go. Went to the headset this time. Yeah, you're very good points, Ritu, absolutely. Uh, 
you know, and we need to uh, also really get back to the basics, I think. Um, and we all have to be big enough to say as professionals, hey, what's your opinion, Ritu? What's your opinion, Mike? What do you think this guy weighs, okay? Uh, you know, let's take a breath. You know, they do it in surgery. Everybody takes a breath and let it out. And okay, everybody goes around the room. What, you know, what do you think? Are we good to go? Uh, we need to do more of that collaboration at the scene. And we got to get down and touch the patient. You can't check a pulse without touching the patient, without exposing them. Uh, we've got to be assertive and advocating for patient care. And uh, we really have to learn to act. You know, bystanders need to act. We need to act. Sometimes we end up being bystanders in these police situations when we shouldn't be. And that's a lot because we don't know how to act. You know, they're the guys with the guns and the badges. Yeah, they're the authoritative presence there. So some paramedics may be a little more timid and not intervene where others might. This is where the training comes into play. We teach mega codes. We do trauma codes. We do all this stuff. Let's do some scenario-based practical training on how to deal with these situations. You know, and that's that's what's going to help uh, keep people out of trouble in the future. Because you know, at the bottom line is, you know, I hope this doesn't deter people from from uh, signing up for EMS because it's noble work. As Jim Page said, it's the most noble of all professions. And where else can you have a job where you can have such an immediate and positive yeah. impact on somebody's life within a matter of minutes? Okay. Wow. That's powerful. That brings a great sense of gratitude and the public truly does respect us and they truly uh, recognize the value of what we do in our communities. And we can't let a case like this deter others from getting involved. And that's why we got to take that leadership role and move on. What can we do to make this better? Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I, I think, oh, I'm sorry, go oh, ahead. Go ahead Mike. Oh, well, go I was ahead. just going to say, you know, you know, I think back to kind of, there's been a lot of comments, um, you know, in the chat, thank you guys for interacting so well and, and just posing those comments and, and questions, but, but really, you know, when you go back to training and, and we've talked about, you know, I remember when I first, it was back 2016. Um, we, I came up with this scenario, um, for our crews that essentially they came back to their station and found uh, that a shootout had just happened behind their station. And it was basically a static scene. And what we did was we walked, we walked through like this imaginary, except we had visuals. We had a cop car, we had a patient down, we had a police officer shot. Um, and, and I'll get to the point here in a sec. So hang with me for a sec. Um, but essentially what we were trying to do was not what they were going to do in that moment. Although there, there was a piece of that, right? Like who, who do you go after first? Do you go after the patient? Do you go after the police officer? But what it was doing was trying to get that Rolodex card in their brains to sort of give them something to reference if something like this should ever happen in the future, right? And so back to the, you know, inter interagency training, training with police, training with other responders, training with the hospital, whatever it may be, like really the point of that has got to be so we can at least set some kind of a uh, initial sort of, sort of way to maneuver if you do find yourself in one of these, right? Because I could only imagine what would have happened if, if there would have been some kind of joint training on excited delirium in 2019 with the police in the fire department. You know, um, you know, would right. there have been something different that occurred? I don't, I don't really know, but I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for just getting that Rolodex card. So there is something to refer to two years from now, a year from now, three years from now, whatever it happens to be. Um, because it's just so, it's such a, it's such a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And it's interesting, you know, we talk about, you know, criminal versus civil, but believe it or not, the lines are pretty blurred between criminal negligence and civil negligence. You know, the standards are, you know, very similar and criminal negligence is a gross deviation from the standard of reasonable care. Uh, uh, a substantial and unjustifiable risk that death will result from your conduct. And that's what happened, what the conviction was here. But that's similar to the gross negligence standard that we see on the civil side. So, you know, in my view, it's all about doing our best, being ma making sure that we're putting the patient at the forefront of everything we do. Uh, we treat everybody with respect and dignity and it can't go wrong. You know, it, I think ultimately then people outside looking at what we do, we're going to see that. And, and sort of give us uh, the benefit of the doubt. 
but uh, certainly uh, lots we have to do here. It's great to see some of our good friends on here commenting, Jeff Jarvis, Bill Toon, commenting about uh, not enough mental health training in EMS. Absolutely, uh, we need more. An ambulance is not a bus and a call is not a job from Steve Rahm, love that comment. Uh, you can't improve what you don't measure, Tim K said. Uh, uh, Bill asks, will there be an appeal? I haven't heard, but I imagine there will be, quite frankly. So we'll see what happens. Um, we're not sure yet. So just to there kind of is. review. Rob Lawrence with the hashtag, oh. more than just a ride. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see uh, Rob and everyone else just jumping in here this morning. Yeah. Uh, it's been really good. But we've covered a lot of stuff this morning. But really, um, I, you know, being assertive and advocating for your patient, right? That's a huge thing. Conducting a prop assessment. This is right from the article that you published in GEMS just the, just the other day, Friday. Conducting that prompt assessment, getting down on the patient's level, touching the patient, right? Getting that physical contact with this patient to make sure you can assess them, right? Skin temperature, pulses, all that kind of stuff. Actually getting a set of vital signs, using the monitor when you can. We've touched on that a little bit, right? You can't always get it on right away, but at some point, We've got to have that, right? Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about, which just makes perfect sense, is using the, all the R's when you're administering your medication, right? Right patient, right dose, right time, all those kind of things. Follow your protocols and consider exceptions. There are going to be times, and Ritu, you can speak to this a little bit, where you are going to deviate from your protocols a little bit. But that kind of goes right along with the next point here, and that is, your documentation, right? And I know in this case, there was a little bit of him and and Han and maybe not exactly telling the truth on exactly, exactly what happened. And I don't, didn't get into that, but I did read that in one of the articles, but um, I mean, we have to do a good job of documenting these encounters, right? Ritu, and from your perspective, talk a little bit about that deviating from your protocols a little bit, because I think most people, and there was an air of, this in some of the comments I've seen, not, not on our broadcast today, but just looking at like Twitter has been my place to go to because it's just uh, the wild west out there uh, or X, sorry, whatever it happens to be. But, you know, people tend to think of protocols. Maybe these are people that are outside the industry or don't, don't understand is that, you know, if X, then do Y or if a, then you do B. And that is not exactly kind of the way these guidelines are written, right? But I mean, to the to the general public, they may see it or hear or think of it like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we just did our multi AC training block in Washington County last week, and and uh, for one of our um, scenarios, I happened to pick up our our protocol book, which is now literally three hundred um, pages, and. Um, and dropped it on the ground and it made this loud bang noise. Our protocol book is actually bigger than the textbook now. And, and unfortunately that is because we are attempting to um, try to capture as much as we can. But the reality is this, I cannot, and we write our protocols. We actually have to do our end of our, our new protocol um, podcast. Um, coming up but you know we write our protocol with a committee made up of medical directors and ems providers uh we have a lot of input uh, despite all of that there's just absolutely no way we can get every clinical situation on, on paper and if we did it would be ridiculously impossible for our paramedics to remember every single step of the protocol so fundamentally That's a good point you know I always tell people, I mean, one of the comments that I make, because I try to do everything in pithy quotes, but, you know, is our our new paramedics know the protocols backwards and forward, and our really good experienced paramedics take care of patients. And, and, and you know, we recognize, and we re it's on page one of our protocol book, we recognize that we cannot account for every clinical situation. And... Um, but that's when we expect you to fall back on your training and education that we've provided as part of this all the way back into, into medic school or even EMT school uh, and do the best that you can for your patient and then make sure that your documentation reflects that in a positive manner. Yeah, I'd like to comment on what Ritu just said about protocols. Absolutely excellent points. Uh, protocols, the ones I've seen lately, some of them are so complicated and extensive, it requires a PhD in engineering to figure out the flow charts, okay? 
we need to simplify the treatment protocols. And we have to recognize that, you know, those who write these protocols, the protocols are becoming the standard of care. Let me repeat that. Your treatment protocols are becoming the standard of care, not just in a case like this, but also civil cases, okay? Mm. And then they'll bring in experts to testify to the validity of those protocols and the reasonableness of those protocols. So we really need to know our protocols and recognize that, as Ritu just said, nothing, not everything fits in the same, you know, protocol. You're going to have some deviations, and I hate that word, but uh, situations where you may not be able to perform certain steps of that protocol. Let's document why we did or didn't do this. Okay, that's the key. Okay. And unfortunately, we some of our treatment gets to be a little too protocol driven, and we forget our common sense and good judgment that has to play into this. And that's why you got to have a good training, an active medical director who's involved, like Ritu is, and his systems that he deals with, and and review all this stuff with your people. That's really the key. You ask the average young paramedic coming out of school today, you know, recite back to me the protocol for dealing with a agitated patient. I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. Okay. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, that's the key. Uh, sometimes as uh, Steve Ron just mentioned, uh, protocols are a cookbook. Okay. <laughs> just be a thinking cook. I love it. Great. Yeah. I've, uh, I've often made the case that our protocol book should really be just one line. <laughs> just don't do stupid shit. <laughs> that's all it should say. <laughs> You know, and yes. probably the second line should be treat everybody with respect and kindness. Yep. Because, um, you know, you just don't, I mean, you, there, it doesn't cost you anything. It might, and, and, and we have to acknowledge when we say that, we have to acknowledge, and I think we have multiple times today, but we have to acknowledge compassion fatigue and the stress of, of the current environment that this job has created. That being said, um, I have found that when my compassion well is low, which usually happens on the third night in a row, um, that taking a moment for myself and then actually try taking that extra piece to be kind to somebody helps refill that compassion well. Um, but I mean, we 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 have to recognize that our providers are 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 being stressed and the compassion well can be low, but. At the end of the day, I think you're taking better care of yourself when you're kind and, and respectful to patients, uh, as well as uh, taking better care of the patients. And again, at the very least, understand that you are now on television. This is at the very least be performative about it, uh, because yes, everything, everything is caught on on camera. And if it's on the police body cam, it's public. That's the other. That's the other thing that people don't understand. There are EMS agencies that are doing body cams now, where those are very clearly under QI protections, and those aren't public. But police body cams are considered part of the public uh, domain, and and those are all available to anybody. Yeah, that's the reality of the world. Uh, assume you're on camera at all times. Absolutely, uh, and certainly, uh, compassion fatigue is of great concern, and. And uh, we just got to make sure that we're providing that support for our providers too to help them, so that you know on the next call they they don't they're not dismissive to the patient or disrespectful because that really comes down to it. In fact, there's been studies that show in negligence actions brought against healthcare providers, in almost all the cases, one of the key issues was lack of respect. The healthcare provider didn't listen to me. Uh, they treated me poorly. They were rude. You know, all of these things play into it, uh, you know, and and absolutely uh, that can help be a real uh, preventive step and just being nice and kind and compassionate, uh, even in situations that are difficult, uh, like in this one. Yeah, that's that's good. There are lots of good comments still coming in. I mean, we're not getting into some of this nitty gritty stuff like, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I agree with Josh here. He says, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, if we don't give the right tools for people to determine body weight, for example, then how do we expect them to be able to give a weight based medication? I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I mean, we're not really tackling this today. We will definitely get on 
to this later. But I, I wanted to I wanted to sort of as we're starting to creep in on our uh, into the show here, I wanted to ask you something, Steve. Um, so I watched uh, Doug uh, just did a NAEMSP or a Florida NAEMSP webcast prior right. to the verdict actually coming down. And one of the things right. that 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 he said that was super interesting to me, I want to get your thought on it. And maybe we can sort of talk about this for a second. But uh, again, this was prior to the verdict coming out. And he said, mm -hmm. look, if they're acquitted, I don't think there's any reason to get super excited about anything. And if they're convicted, there's probably no real reason to get too excited about anything. Um, kind of based on what we've talked about today, how there's, this isn't real, there's nothing really new occurring other than maybe the, the body worn cameras and the fact that we're going to, you know, this, a lot of this gets documented. Yeah. Um, do you, do you still, uh, well, do you still agree with that? I mean, is there, well, the way I heard it, Mike freaking is, out right now? yeah, I think what Doug's point was that we pretty much wrote that article before the verdict. Okay. Right. Right. It doesn't matter whether it's an acquittal or it was a conviction. The points are the same. The teaching points are the same. We have the same lessons to be learned from this case regardless. And I think that was the point he was really making in that uh, uh, webcast. It was excellent. I thought uh, he summed it up very well. Uh, yep. You know, these lessons belong to all of us was a phrase that Doug used in that uh, webinar with Dr. Antevi. And we got mm -hmm. to incorporate these lessons into our day-to-day -day practice. That's the key, you know? Uh, yeah, let me, can I, can I make one, one comment there? Because I this, yeah. um, th it doesn't matter that this went to civil court, criminal court, any of that. There's a young man who died. Right. Yeah. Right? That's, yep. at that yes. point, that's when the lesson becomes important. Yes, we should have done better to prevent this from happening. But, but uh that that's we have to go all the way back to that i think a lot of people are stressed about uh, the, about the legal and i appreciate i appreciate uh steve the point that it's really not changed that much but the fundamental lessons that we need to take from this is that um there is a young man who's dead and they're yeah. dead because of an interaction with the public safety system period uh and we as ems played a role on that um, we can get into the nitty gritty about this and that and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we just have to look at the case and learn and do better so that we can do whatever we can to prevent this from happening again. Absolutely. And I think we also have that a lot of progress has been made since 2019. Keep in mind, this case is over two years old, three years old, and uh, things are changing. But we need to change internally. We need to change ourselves because if we don't do it, guess who's going to do it? The state legislatures, which they did in Col yeah. Colorado, right. passing yeah. a law prohibiting use of ketamine in law enforcement situations with some exceptions. So we need to take control and ownership of this and fix it. And there's so many things that we all know on this uh, podcast that we can do now and start putting into action to really make those positive changes that we need to make. Uh, I know in Florida, Dr. Shevsky talked with the, in the Antevi's webinar Friday about, you know, getting medical control more involved in some of these decisions, you know, of giving ketamine or not. You know, what, what, what happened to the days where you can call medical control and actually get advice and talk it through with the, the doctor on the other end of the line? We don't always have that today. We need to do more of that, I think. And it, it's if nothing else, it's getting another opinion and talking and ac asking other people. You know, somebody said you can't, you know, determine body weight that efficient, efficiently. Yeah, it's very subjective, which is why you ask everybody who's standing around looking at the patient, what do you think he weighs? Okay. You yeah. know, what's your thought yeah. there? Okay. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Um, all right. Well, listen, I think we've done a good job of covering a lot of this stuff here. Um, you know, again, it's a, um, it's an absolute shame that we have to come on here and talk about this today. Um, like we have mentioned, you know, Elijah McLean is dead from this. Um, and I think the biggest tragedy of all this, notwithstanding, of course, the, the poor kid who's dead, um, would be for us to ignore the lessons identified in this whole thing. Um, and I have a right. feeling um, that there's going to be quite a bit of that, right? We are such a diverse industry 
with lots of different interactions with whether it be a medical director, whether it be clinical leadership, whether it be quality uh, assurance or quality improvement. Um, a lot of this uh, will probably uh, fall on deaf ears. And, uh, and that, that is going to be the biggest shame. So what I want to do before I close this out is, uh, Steve, I'll let you get the last word, but we're two as we're closing okay. in on the end of the uh, broadcast here. Uh, what are your sort of final thoughts? And we'll, we'll talk more about this as we get going, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Like I said, it's the holiday weekend. We got a lot of stuff going. So we're two, uh, medical director thought here. Uh, first, uh, thanks to Steve coming on. We threw this together last yesterday. I really appreciate that. I appreciate Tim case for helping facilitate this. Um, I think, I think that from a medical director's perspective, um, you know, it, it increases my, um, for me personally, again, it just reinforces that I need to probably get even more involved than I am as a medical director. Now I'm lucky that we have a team of medical directors that work together both within my agency and in the other agencies I work with. And so I feel that our paramedics get a fair amount of medical director uh, involvement. Um, um, and I, I, I have to recognize as a medical director, the amount of severe stress that our colleagues uh, who work in the field have been under the last uh, four years and recognize the fact that this only makes the stress worse, despite everything we're, we're saying about it, it's probably not as huge a change as we think it is. Um, but we have to acknowledge that that creates doubt and stress. And then it's my job as a medical director. I try to say this to my crews all the time. My job is to make your job easier. And so um, I need to listen to them to find out how I can do that. Well, well said. Um, my final comments really are this, that the lessons from this case really strike at the very fundamentals of why we all got into EMS in the first place. To help others uh, in need and put their interests at the forefront of everything we do, number one, to treat all patients with respect, dignity, kindness, as Dr. Ratu said, uh, Dr. Ratu said, and compassion, regardless of the situation they're in and regardless of whether they put themselves in that situation, and three, to take prompt action to access and assess the patient with all of our senses and all the skills we possess and all the necessary tools that we have at our disposal to treat the patient. Uh, that's really the, the message here. And uh, somebody sent me, uh, after the other one of the other cases, sent me this quote from Joel, uh, Jeff Alstein, which I think is an excellent, Joel Alstein, uh, your job is not to judge your job is not to figure out if someone deserves something. Your job is to lift the fallen, to restore the broken, and to heal the hurting. And I think that epitomizes what we do in EMS. And I, I see the glass half full here. I see great opportunity to renew that spark of compassion that ignited us all in getting into this in the first place and allow us to reset and rethink. Uh, how can we do better next time? That's, that's what it really comes down to in my view. And uh, uh, absolutely, I think we can go forth on a positive note here. I agree. All right. Well, gentlemen, I will get us out of here. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for jumping on here. Uh, Ritu, it was great, great to, to see here. you again. Thanks for working for your uh, colleagues at, uh, at the hospital this weekend. And so on behalf of the EMS show, appreciate you guys all jumping on with us uh, on the Saturday early morning for some of you. And uh, with that, we will uh, see you on the next episode of the EMS show. You guys all have a great day. And we will talk to you soon. Happy. Hey, thanks for listening to the EMS show. Let's continue this conversation. What do you say? Check out the official Facebook page and Twitter feed. The EMS show is.